bang. Weird, isn't it? Well, if you're one of the, like, three people that watch this after the premiere, no, probably not. That's besides the point. Welcome to view, or just viewing the, the viewing the review. Now sit back, get your popcorn, get your Pepsi, get your diabetes, expand the waistline, prepare for the best and most in-depth review. Red Dead Redemption 2, of all time. Red Dead Redemption 2. This game is pretty special, as not only is it the second coming of Christ, but also the best game I've probably ever played in my life. The following footage provided for the review is taken from my PC, which consists of a GTX 1650 and an i7 6700K processor. My main thoughts and opinions will come from my experience on the base Xbox One, but nevertheless, this is a pretty cool experience for video gamers. In this review, I plan to cover different aspects of the game through different points. Firstly, I'll cover the graphics, sound design, and music. After that, is the general gameplay and missions. And finally, is the holy grail, the story, and Arthur Morgan. First thing to cover is the graphics and sound design, and my god, even on the base, now last gen consoles, this game is absolutely breathtaking to look at. The graphics in this game, as most people have seen, look absolutely incredible, especially for the year it came out, and absolutely stomps on any other game's graphics since. The snow in the first chapter was a great way to show off the new Rage engine Rockstar is using. But in the snow, as the game opens up more and more, you see different regions with just as much detail, from the rocky hills and mountains in the north and east to the sandy open desert in the west. So yeah, some pretty good graphics on the game. Really, really nice graphics. I like the game. What a great game. Uh, next is the sound design and music, and damn, they are just as good. Sound design is unique, diverse, and greatly fleshed out. This can be from feet dragging through the snow in the mountains, to revolver shot in different areas. For example, a revolver shot outdoors leaves an echo it bang, whereas indoors it ricochets from the different wall to give a more condensed sound effect. Even an example of the most minute details in this game, such as the revolver shot on a rock, leaving a very classic western scene. Finally, the music of the game, as composed by Woody Jackson. The music has a perfect fit for every single situation, from the loud, powerful bass and drum of the fights, to the sweet and wholesome harmonies that play as you leave the mountains in the first chapter of the game. They come in and they're all like, oh, oh. <laughs> Then you're all done with the hell that is chapter 5 in the game, and they bring in D'Angelo, like, and he's all like, yeah, stand on So yeah, worth it to D'Angelo, pretty good musician. Uh, sound design and music in this game is pretty good. I, I like the sound design and music. No one cares it's still, so uh, I don't know, 4 out of 5? Yeah, that works, 4 out of 5. Bag. My first playthrough is in awe at the different mechanics and ways that a player can immerse themselves into the game and its beautiful world. 
On repeat playthroughs and when other reviewers pointed out the same mistakes, I began to notice some slight flaws in these mechanics in the game. For realism, every action has a weird out animation which gets very tedious after a while of cleaning my gun over and over and brushing my horse over and over again. These mechanics and animations seem cool and interesting at first, but they get more and more tedious as you get further and further into the game. And all you really want to do is get on with the game, progress through the story and do the interesting and fun side missions that comes with it. Instead, I have to stop every 5 seconds because my horse's health core is getting messed up because I need to brush it. And the horse that I expertly named Target because it keeps on getting shot over and over again and killed, which gets in increasingly annoying when my health core makes it easier to kill. Most importantly of all, and the thing that people actually care about, is a combat and shooting people. Yeah, the combat's pretty bland. I mean, you can do cool stuff like run up and, you know, tackle a guy down and blow his head off with a shotgun, and, you know, that's kind of funny and cool. But really what you're going to do most of the time is put yourself behind some cover, spam LT until you insta-lock onto an enemy like you're some sort of robot and press RT to, on the head to get a kill. This is of course in the case on controller where auto aim is seriously like just unfair. But that's where, you know, the game got released on PS4 and Xbox One consoles where, you know, everyone uses controllers and can just abuse the auto aim. And most enemies are pretty bland, just some guy that stands there and shoots you or, you know, maybe gets behind cover and shoots you instead, you know. The only real variety in enemies comes in like chapter 6 of the game when guys with machetes can run up and insta kill you with them, but that's about as far as it goes. Which is kind of understandable given the limitations of, you know, the setting in 19... wait, 1899. <laughs> On a first playthrough this didn't really matter because of how entranced I were by, you know, all the other incredible mechanics and interesting details of the game. But on the second playthroughs, and probably because I heard these other reviewers saying the same thing, I began to think the same myself. Next up is actual mission structure as well. The game begins in the snowy mountains, away from the action in the west, to give you not so subtle tutorials on how to maintain health, shoe, and hunt. I wish on other playthroughs these tutorials could be skipped or, you know, less obvious and demanding, but I guess that's a simple thing, I'll let it off. Oh, it does get pretty annoying and boring most of the time on other playthroughs, but not everyone's gonna play it like 30 times like some random guy did. Tutorials continue into chapter 1 and are slightly less subtle, but still not that subtle. Uh, and are less boring, given the different environments, and less hand-holding. However, faults in mission design overall do begin to stand out here, especially in this mission. Here a guy is threatening one of the gang members, Tilly Jackson. And I chose to shoot the guy, but because he was needed later in the story for a mission that does not too much, it, you're not allowed to kill him. You just, you just not. Uncle and Mary Beth, they're across the street. Okay. There's no different option. No, nothing different happens. You, he has to be there for the story, and therefore you cannot kill him. And now the big part, the stuff that people really care about, and that's right, the story of Red Dead Redemption 2, and why it makes it probably the best game I've ever played. Not that that's too hard to do, but it's also unbelievably great, so it, it's going to be hard to beat this, to be fair. I believe that for many, including myself, the, re the story of Red Dead Redemption 2 was probably the very best part of the game. 
Although it does make some mission stinker cheese, it is still entirely worth it for the incredible story that the game delivers. In my script I've written a damn lot about the story, but for the sake of time I plan on making it a bit briefer. But if, if you guys want, I can make another story video. Just remember to thumbs up the video, show your love, and like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell and let me know what you thought of the video. Did you know that as of the time of making this video, absolutely no one on earth is subscribed to my channel? Please subscribe and hit the notification bell. I'm begging. Anyway, uh, we first meet the Vandalin gang when they're stuck in the snowy mountains of the game after just barely escaping an attack from the police after a butchered ferry job goes wrong. Through dialogue we find out more about this ferry job, like how v Dutch killed an innocent lady, with seemingly no reason at all. On first playthroughs he seemed like pointless little details, but on second playthroughs I really like to see the small minor details and foreshadowings that come in different parts and conversations in the game. Eventually the gang makes it out of the mountains with two new members, Sadie Adler and Kieran, who used to be a former member of the O'Driscoll's gang, which is rival to the Vandalin gang. An interesting detail I spotted with some of the gang members is that they take, many of them come from the different cultures that immigrants had in the, um, America at the time of this game setting. For example, Sean is Irish, Herr Strauss is German, and Javier is Mexican, all the most common immigrants in America at the time. As a fun little history fa fact for you, remember to like and subscribe and you can hear more, as well as even more communist propaganda from the move camp. The main protagonist of the game that you take control of is one of the big three of the gang, the right hand man and communist enthusiast Arthur Morgan. Before leaving the snowy mountains however, they also obviously make sure to rob the bank of Mr. Colonel Cornelius Cornwall, <laughs> right, sorry, uh, Leviticus Cornwall. And despite Arthur and Jose's smart hesitation. He set up camp near the humble town of Valentine, do a little troll in there, get caught by Levitas cause Cornwall, get a few fights, get drunk with Leggy or whatever. And uh, Kieran saves Arthur one time, so that's kinda cool. And then Arthur and Kieran have a uh, gay relation oh wait no that's the script of my fantasy video coming soon, like and subscribe. Chapter three, you move near about roads and you know you troll these rich people. That's pretty funny. Uh, you, you, Arthur gets tortured, which is kind of messed up by the O'Driscolls, and Sean gets shot, which was actually kind of kind of sad. But uh, we also got to you know mess up the Braithwaite's, and it, it, there's an absolutely banging soundtrack to go with that. So you know, it works out good in the end. They move nearer into modern civilization to the big city of Saint Denis, like John's son. Uh, but you steal him back. The game end him, the gang's up against the wall, and they decide to rob the big bang. However, Dutch is now becoming insane, which is a brilliant reference to Breaking Bad and ha Walter White's descent into becoming Heisenbunga. <laughs> After the Saint Denis bank robbery goes bust, they go to Guama, but you know, Guama sucks my ass and all that, that really happens is Dutch randomly kills some poor old lady. Everyone gets back reasonably safely, but the law is there, there's a cool fight, that's pretty cool. And then uh, Arthur gets t diagnosed with tuberculosis and you know, that's another great Breaking Bad reference to Walter White's cancer diagnosis. Arthur's tuberculosis diagnosis serves as the beginning of the end for Arthur and the beginning of his redemption through, that makes the game so great. The great thing about this game though is it leaves stuff like this to speculation and as to whether Arthur was ever really a good man in the first place. Both honourable and dishonourable options for almost anything work towards a story. An honourable choice will show that Arthur maybe was a good man the whole time. While dishonourable proves that he was fully redeemed by his actions in the 6th chapter. 
course, the murder from the story is broken when you go on a mad rampage and kill all of Saint Denis in one go, but that's sort of besides the point. You can do that in pretty much any Rockstar game, and no one really seems too bothered, so that's <laughs> fine. They're going to keep going and move on to the upper area of the map, which is far more depressing, reflecting the gang's depressed and much well, more worn down state. First, Molly O'Shea, Dutch's wife, is believed to be a rat that sold out the gang to the, the Pinkertons. Dutch also manipulates the Native Americans that, are, that have tensions with the government. Some people argue that this is a sort of pointless addition to the cast of characters and right before the end, but I believe it does go on to show Dutch's sheer descent and manipulation of others. In the end, a war breaks out between the Native Americans and government agencies. Why you go to help? Well, but the son of the general to the Native Americans gets killed, little to Dutch's own care. Now that according to Dutch, the army is focused on them, they leave to rob a train and go to Tahiti, apparently, because that's the big plan. John is believed to be dead after the train robbery and getting shot, and... Abigail is then taken by the Pinkertons to be held captive. Dutch rides off and you go to save her in the final mission of the main story. You ride back, John is obviously alive because the first game happened so no one was really that worried about that. And the gang breaks out into a final standoff. The Pinkertons break it up and you run away to try and save John and get him out. Chapter 3 in the game, John eventually leaves whilst Arthur stays and fights Miss, where Arthur tells Hosea and other camp members that if he were to die, he'd want to be facing the west and watching the sunrise. In the honourable ending, this is the exact death he gets, which is very poetic and wholesome. The epilogue basically just follows John through getting by as a family guy. <laughs> family guy. Anyway, eventually he tracked down Micah and Dutch after having his full family set up on the beach as Hope Ranch that we can come to know and love from the first game. Micah is stationed back up in the mountains where the game began and you got to kill him. Thank God. When you get there, a, a mission with the, probably the best soundtrack in the game, or possibly one of the best. American Venom plays and you absolutely get to tear through Micah's entire camp and everything he's been building up over the past few years. You soon find Micah and the final, FINAL standoff of the game happens. And then Dutch steps out, out of complete nowhere. After a bit of back and forth pattern between the boys, tensions are high. John demands Dutch say something, but after everything that's happened, he has nothing left to say. And he can't give a big speech to the gang. Everything's over. So he just shoots Micah and leaves. And finally you get to shoot him like, you know, nuts, balls, brain or whatever. Or just six shots unloaded into his head. Finally. And so is the end of a game. And a 30 minute credits roll. And so marks the end to the, this incredible game. And probably one of the best stories I've ever played in my life. The amount of times I've deleted the story segment and redone it to be more brief is unreal to me. But it's all saved on another folder, so you know, it's another video, like and subscribe, guys, I'm in the notification bell. It's because there's so much I think I want to talk about, about this m brilliant, massive game, which is why you should like and subscribe and hit the notification bell, please. So many easter eggs and different stories hidden in the world, the side missions, the main missions, the subtle details in conversations and diaries. It's just so incredible to me all adding up to such an amazing game and story. It certainly is a slow game, and definitely not a perfect one to everyone, but it's pretty perfect to me, and I'd easily recommend it to anyone with the patience to play through it. Every member of the gang and every inch of this game just screams that it's something important. There has been slight controversy over the game and 
the amount of crunch time that went into it just to get some dynamic horse testicles that no one ever looks at and I do not at all endorse it of course. The turnout besides the pointless horse testicles is so wonderful, spectacular and so breathtaking. I just have to recommend it. So yeah, Leggy's pretty funny, Arthur is pretty cool, uh, Lumbago Man says Lumbago, that's pretty funny, you do a bit of trolling, funny Break Bad references, uh, I'd give it a 6 out of 10. See the fire.